We are looking at um, a rather significant portion of John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Uh, so we're not going to look at every detail. I'm going to try to touch on, on virtually everything, but, but try to uh, convey the burden of this particular text. Uh, so let me go ahead and read it for you, John 13, verses 1 through 17, and then we'll go ahead and dig into it and see what it is the Lord is teaching us. We read, beginning in verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do uh, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now as we move into chapter 13, we see that the Passover has finally arrived. And Jesus is with his disciples, presumably, in the upper room. Now it's been noted that John in his gospel fills in some of the gaps. The gaps that we might say the other gospel writers left. But gaps not in the sense that anything is missing, because we do believe what the Lord tells us, that he has given to us a complete and perfect standard and rule of what we should believe and how it is we should live. But filling in the gaps in the sense of those areas that the other gospel writers, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did not include in their gospels. That's why John is unique in many ways. It, it contains a lot of things that the other gospels don't include. Now John was likely familiar with the other Gospels and with what they contained. He perhaps had read them because his was the last Gospel written. This may be why he doesn't give us an account of the Last Supper in his Gospel since the other three Gospel writers had already included that in their Gospels. But what he does give us, on the other hand, is what Jesus taught on that occasion surrounding that Last Supper, surrounding that Passover feast, just before his betrayal, just before his crucifixion, that which the other gospel writers left out. And that is the next five chapters that we see in the Gospel of John, uh, chapters 13 through, I believe, 17. And this is what we call the upper room discourse, because we believe they were in the upper room and they were celebrating, or at least preparing to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now here Jesus begins with a demonstration of humility and with a demonstration of love. He washes the disciples' feet, giving to them and to us a lesson uh, 
of what we should be doing for one another. Now this morning I do want us to consider two things. I want us to consider the love that Jesus has for his disciples and that would include us. If we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are his disciples, he has this love for us. And by the way, if you aren't trusting Jesus, he offers you this love this morning. And then secondly, how we are to follow his example in loving one another. Now first of all, let's consider Jesus' love for his disciples. We read in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, John tells us that what we're about to read took place just before the feast of Passover. And there is some question as to exactly what John meant here because he said it was before the feast. And if it was before the feast, then it's kind of hard to actually place this within the feast itself. And so in the context of the Last Supper. And so some believe because of that, that what John meant was that this is a meal that took place perhaps a couple of days before the feast, maybe in Bethany, maybe with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. While others understand Jesus saying, or John saying actually in this case, that it was just before he was making these remarks, but then he moves into that feast. So that what we see Jesus teaching here actually is in the context of the Last Supper. And if we were to take the time to read through the entire discourse and look at the very end, we'll find that this time that Jesus has with his disciples ends with their going out to the Garden of Gethsemane, which would lead us to believe that this is, in fact, the Last Supper. They are at the Passover feast. This is in the context of the Last Supper. But since it's not mentioned in here, we have to kind of guess where it may have taken place. We do know it comes immediately at the end of the Supper, but again, from what I've seen or what we've just read, you'll see that there is some question. Well, now getting to the content. Jesus knew his time had finally come to depart from the world and return to his Father. Now, if we had time to think about this, we remember that Jesus is the Son of God. He has lived eternally with the Father. He took on a human nature and entered into this world. He understood as a man that he had come from God and he was going to return to God. But now the focus is what is he going to do realizing the time of his departure has come? Well, John says, having now loved his disciples throughout his ministry, through his continual care, his protection, his instruction, he loved them to the very end, which means to the very end of his life and certainly means to the very end of theirs as well, which, of course, trusting in him would never end which loving them to the end is why he is now about to lay down his life for them so that they might live forever. Now John was referring to Jesus' care and his service to his disciples who were on the earth, but let's not forget that Jesus did not at that time when he left the world stop loving his own. He still loves them. He still loves us. Those of us who trust in him, those of us who belong to him, those of us who are in the world right now. He loves and he cares for us from heaven. And of course, as we're going to see, being entrusted with all power and authority, he has the ability to do that. He will love us. He will care for us to the very end. To the very end of our lives here and then to the very end of eternity. He will take us then to be with him forever. If you, had, if you have trusted him, then that is as certain to take place as it was for the disciples minus the one that he continues to point out as an exception. Now, it was at this time that Jesus did something which may seem unique. I think sometimes we, we sort of you know, look at this as an extraordinary example of something Jesus did, of humility. But we do need to understand that this is something that he had been doing all along. Remember, he loved them to the end. This is just a continuation of that love because his whole life was a life of love and a life of ministry and a life of service to his disciples. Well, what we see him do here is simply another example of that. He takes the role of a servant, which he never actually stopped being, 
and he washed the disciples' feet. We read in verses 2 through 5. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So we see here during the Passover meal, the devil was already tempting Judas to betray Jesus. It was in his heart to do it for the money. Remember, Judas was a thief. The only reason he followed Jesus was because he liked to pilfer the bag that he was allowed to carry. And Jesus knew that and John knew that. Well, he was already tempted. And at this point, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him, had put all things into his hands, all those who would be his for, as a reward for laying down his life, that is all his children, as well as the power that he would need and the authority he would need to keep them having trusted in him and the power to rule and govern over all of creation, to rule and overrule for their good, knowing that the Father had sent him into the world and that he was returning to him, takes off his outer garment. Again, two layers of clothing, of course. The outer layer would get in his way. And so he takes that off, he sets it aside, he takes a, a towel and ties it around his waist, pours water into a basin, and begins washing the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel. Now, one thing that is interesting here that John Gill notes in his commentary is that foot washing at this particular event was not really a Jewish custom. It wasn't something they would regularly do at the Passover. It wasn't something that they would necessarily do when they entertained people privately or something that they would do for one another at their common meals. But it was something they would do when they were entertaining strangers or travelers, people who were just passing through. When they would enter their house, they would wash their feet as you know, a comfort, as an act of hospitality. Now, we don't know then why Jesus perhaps was doing this except for the reasons that he gives us later, but it was not the Jewish custom. And I thought it was interesting. Perhaps here we see Jesus making a statement to his disciples, doing something out of the ordinary, that they were pilgrims, that they were strangers in this world, and that they would soon depart, even as Jesus himself was preparing to go back to the Father. So seeing the condition of this world and knowing how wonderful heaven will be, the reminder that, that we too are just strangers and pilgrims passing through, that this isn't our permanent home, is also a welcome idea. We should not be at all sorry if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to leave this world. You know, sadly, many times we find ourselves as Christians, not wanting to give up what we see and what we experience, even though a lot of what we see and experience is, is bad. We don't want to give it up. We want to hold on to it. We don't want to go to the place that God has prepared, which is full of glory and love and grace. And yet, if we had the right attitude and the right mind towards it, we would be like the Apostle Paul, who said to depart from this world and to be with Christ is very much better. We need to have that attitude because that is the only attitude that corresponds with the truth, with what God actually says. To hate our lives here in order that we may gain them there. But now, one thing that was always true about foot washing was that when it was done, it wasn't something the master would do for the servant, but the servant would do for the master. And it was an act of the greatest humility for it to be the other way around. But that is exactly what happens here. Jesus, the Son of God, who is God in our nature, humbled himself, took the role of a servant, which again was not an unusual thing. That's what Jesus did. He, he served, didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he washed his disciples' feet. Now understanding who he is, and the disciples had a good idea of who Jesus was by this time, it's easy to understand why Peter was so uncomfortable when Jesus finally reaches him. John writes in verse 6, so he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? 
Now, we have to assume here that Peter was not the first person served in line here. And the others apparently didn't object, but they submitted to it without a word. But Peter could not bring himself to allow it. Now, we do need to understand Jesus was not doing this for no reason, and he wasn't doing it just as an act of humility. There was a spiritual lesson that was involved here. There was an object lesson. Jesus is going to say, I want you to do this for one another, even as I've done this to you. Humble yourselves to serve one another. But he was also providing a spiritual lesson. And we see an indication of this in what we read in verse 7. Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. But again, Peter objects, even though Jesus says, you know, I, I want to do this for you. I'm trying to teach you something. But Peter still objects. In verse 8, Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now here's where we begin to see a double meaning in what Jesus is saying. Because ask yourself this question, how could washing Peter's feet change him in any way or give Peter an interest in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it, it couldn't, could it? it it's, it's something that is external. It's even like baptism, you know, the waters of baptism. They can't give you an interest in Christ. They only are uh, symbolic. I should say baptism is a symbol of what can, which is the washing of your sins away through faith in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he has done. Washing Peter's feet could not affect this, but Jesus washing Peter with his own blood through his sacrifice on the cross could do this, and certainly is what the Lord had already done. This is really what Jesus is teaching. Now I've already mentioned his whole ministry had been one continual act of loving and serving the disciples. He was pointing to the fact, pointing his disciples and Peter to the fact that he was about to perform the greatest act of service that he had up to this point on the cross for Peter and the disciples. This wasn't the beginning, and it wouldn't be the end. And basically, Jesus is saying to Peter, if you're not going to let me serve you now in administering what is basically an object lesson of what it is I'm about to do on the cross, how can I serve you by dying on the cross for your sins? You have to receive what it is I am offering to you. Now, we still don't know whether Peter understood this or whether he realized that hereafter is as, as, um, we're as Jesus just told him. Or that Peter simply understood the fact that Jesus was saying, you have to let me do this, Peter, or you have no part with me. But Peter replies in verse 9, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. If my not letting you wash my feet now means I'm going to be cut off from you, then give me a full bath because I don't want to be cut off from you. I want to be with you. Now, Jesus obviously has him moving in the right direction, but there's something more that he wants to teach him in verses 10 and 11. You don't need a full bath, Peter. Okay? Jesus said to him, he who has bathed, who's already taken the bath, needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you, are clean. Now, Jesus was washing Peter's feet to show him that once he had been cleansed by his blood through the blood of his cross, he only needed to be touched up, as it were, from time to time, and actually that would be from moment to moment and day to day because we do sin every day, almost, well, virtually every moment in word, thought, and deed because we're still imperfect. There's going to be some imperfection in us. Well, he was teaching Peter, that's going to happen. While you're in the world, while you're walking in this world, your feet are going to be soiled and they're going to need to be washed. And so you will need to be cleansed in that way from time to time. But Jesus also wanted Peter and the disciples to know that they were all, except for the one, already clean. That sacrifice that he was about to make on the cross as you know, was applied backwards from the cross and not just from that time forward. 
It was already being applied to everyone who trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was already being applied to the disciples. They were already clean, but not all of them. Now, Jesus, again, continues to mention this one exception. And that's something we're going to save for the next time we are in John's Gospel. But one thing I would like to note, well, actually two things, okay? The blood of Christ cleanses you from all sins. You are clean if you are trusting in Jesus. And even though, yes, we do need a continual cleansing, which is what the foot washing is representing, those sins are continually cleansed through the blood of Christ. Don't be afraid that if you forget to mention one, that you're not going to be forgiven of that sin. Because when the Lord cleanses you, He cleanses you of all your sins. Yes, it's true that 1 John says that we must be continually confessing our sins. And if we are, He is continually cleansing us of our sins. But that's true of every Christian. If we belong to Him, as we see that we sin against Him, when we, the Spirit brings us to the realization that we have sinned, we confess, we repent, and we ask God for grace to do what is right. So we don't, again, want to think it's contingent upon our confessing, but it does remind us we need that continual cleansing. And John goes on to remind us that if we are walking with him in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Christ continually cleanses us from all of our sins. That's one thing. The other thing is this. Even though we're not going to talk about Judas uh, as far as being the exception, we do want to understand he is the exception. And he was still there. He was with the disciples when Jesus washed their feet, which means that Judas was washed by Jesus as well. Now, foot washing, even having your feet washed by Jesus himself, does not take away your sins. If, if it did, well, then Judas would have been saved. It's a picture of what does take away your sins, which is the death of Christ on the cross, but it must be received by faith. And that's something that Judas did not have. So here we see Jesus, the Son of God, the God of creation, the one who spoke and everything came into being, humbles himself and becomes a servant. He becomes a servant to serve you if you were trusting him this morning. Not just the disciples who were there, but for all who would put their trust in him, which comes out much more clearly in John 17 as he is praying. Everything that Jesus did his perfect submission to his Father's will, his teaching ministry, his suffering and his dying on the cross. He did all these things for you, to wash you from your sins, to give you a perfect righteousness, a perfect record of obedience, because he loves you. And he continues to serve you, even as he served the disciples in that room, now in heaven. As I mentioned before, Jesus rules with absolute authority over the world right now. We're not waiting for Jesus to take up his reign when he comes again in, in a kingdom that's yet in the future. The author to the Hebrews makes it plain as he's quoting the Old Testament scripture from Psalm 110 that as soon as Jesus ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and that he is waiting from that time on while his father subdues all of his enemies under his feet. He is ruling and reigning right now. And because he has that authority, he can make sure that everything that happens in this world, everything that happens to you, will ultimately work out for your benefits. He rules and overrules all things for your good. And he prays for you continually before his Father, pleading his righteousness, pleading his death, and the Father's promise to give you to his Son as a reward for the work that he has done done he will not let you go if you love him if you're following him because he loves you it's too much to let you go he will not lose you but he will love you to the end he will bring you to heaven and he will keep you in heaven forever now if you don't know this love as I mentioned before if you haven't trusted in Jesus if you don't know the love that he has for his own that you know, we, we sang in the hymn, nobody knows the love of Christ except those who are loved by Christ. If you've never experienced that particular love, then receive the Lord Jesus Christ. As he offers himself to you now, receive his love and his mercy 
because he is offering this to you. He offers you this love if you will look to him in faith. He will wash you. He will forgive you. And then he will love you and keep you to the very end, which means he will love you forever. Now secondly, I want us to consider in, in this section more briefly that we are to follow the example that Jesus gave to his disciples. This was not just a picture of what Jesus was about to do in laying down his life for his disciples. It was also an object lesson of what he wanted them to do for one another. And let's just go ahead and start with the applicational point. This is what he wants us to do for each other right here. We read in verses 12 through 17. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. If Jesus, being the master, being the teacher, being God in human flesh, would do this for his own, if he would do this for you and for me, if he would do this for us, how much more should we do it for each other? Because we're not the Lord, we're not the master, we are fellow servants. And yet the master was willing to do this for us. Now, Jesus doesn't mean here that we should, you know, get out a basin of water and towels and begin washing one another's feet. Now, some churches have done that. <laughs> and they've had their members do this for one another as a part of their worship service. And certainly, you know, they, they, they see it as an act of love and they see it as an act of humility. Now, let me just begin by saying certainly it is an act of humility. It's kind of humbling to, to get down and wash somebody's feet, especially, you know, today when they're covered with shoes all the time and they kind of smell and we're a little bit embarrassed and, you know, this kind of thing, right? But it can only really be considered a loving thing to do if that person really needed his feet washed, right? I mean, if you don't need your feet washed, then it, we're just going through the motions. We don't really need to do it. Other churches have actually turned this into a sacrament. I think, you know, there are churches that believe that there are three Three sacraments, there's the Lord's Supper, there's baptism, and there's foot washing. And they believe foot washing is a sacrament because it is a picture of washing of sin, like baptism, in which case we'd say, well, really, what's the difference between then the foot washing and baptism, except, you know, perhaps a little more water in one case, perhaps not. Depends on how you baptize, right? Well, one thing we need to understand is it, even though it may be a picture of what Jesus was about to do for his disciples and what he has done for us, the one thing we do not see in Scripture is this practiced among the disciples, among the churches as a sacrament. We don't even actually see it happening again. We do see the Lord's Supper being celebrated. We do see people being baptized as they repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't see the churches washing feet because I don't think that's what Jesus meant by this. What he actually meant through this is that we should love one another and that we should humble ourselves and serve one another, even as Jesus humbled himself to serve us and to die for us. Uh, Jesus says in John chapter 15, <clears throat> verses 12 through 13, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Okay, that's exactly what Jesus was teaching them in John chapter 13. He was going to lay down his life to wash them of their sins. And he says, that's what I want you to do for one another. Now, if Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to lay his own life aside, to minister to us, even to die for us, shouldn't we do that for one another? That's the master, that's the king, that's the Lord who's doing this for a servant. Shouldn't the servants, who are also happen to be a part of the same family, brothers and sisters, you know, we are basically 
of, well, one family forever. Should we not do this for one another? This is what our Lord wants us to do. His example of love, that's the kind of love that he wants us to have for each other. Laying down our lives for each other doesn't necessarily mean that we're literally going to have to give up our lives or die, although it may mean that. Certainly that's a possibility. But it certainly means that we will, when we need to, set aside our own comforts, set aside our own desires, so that we might meet the real needs of our brothers and sisters around us in the Lord. And I do believe, at least in this context, that Jesus was referring to loving the body of Christ. He's not saying we shouldn't love our enemies or do good to those who use us and despitefully, you know, use us and so forth. He's not saying that, but he is specifically addressing our love for the body of Christ to meet the needs of our brothers and sisters around us, whatever those needs may be. Remember what Jesus said to Paul. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Remember what we read earlier in Matthew chapter 20. The one who humbles himself to become the servant of all is the one who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus wants us to do, to follow his example of humility and love and service toward one another. I think that's, that's easy to see. It's easy to understand. And do you see that that's what he wants? Uh, do you understand that that's what he wants you to do, to follow that example, to serve one another as he served you? Well, if you see this, Jesus says you will be blessed if you do it. Okay, it's, it's not enough to know. And that's true of everything the Lord tells us. We know that we might do. We don't know that we might know. We're not supposed to be in school forever learning, but never actually putting into practice what it is the Lord is teaching us. If we know something, then we need to start doing it as best we can. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to fail in many different ways. But we should begin to do it and pray that God would give us greater grace and greater strength. And you'll find that as you begin to do these things, it will become easier, it will become more joyful, and you'll find yourself becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, as James reminds us, let's not be hearers only, but also doers of the word. Let's seek to be like our Lord Jesus, to follow his example of service, his example of love, towards those who belong to him as well as to those who are outside the church. And by the way, as we read earlier, as the world sees us loving one another the way that Jesus loved us, they will know that we are his disciples. They will know that Jesus exists, that Jesus is alive, that he is real. That is the most powerful testimony. We'll say, well, how, how can that be a testimony? Don't I need all these philosophical arguments in order to convince them? Don't I need to be able to answer all their objections? No. Jesus said, all you need to do is live a life consistent with the gospel, live like him, show that love, and then share the simple message of the gospel, and the Lord will use that to bring them to him. We don't have to go through schools of apologetics in order to evangelize. All we have to do is do what Jesus told us to do. So may the Lord give us all the grace uh, to do that. Now, what I'd like to do, of course, is move into uh, the Lord's Supper. And something that we, we want to do is not see this as something separate that we do, but something that's like the culmination of what we've just seen in here. And I think you, you see there's a very strong connection between what this table represents and what Jesus was just doing. He was just telling his disciples I'm going to die. He knew his time had come. He was about to lay down his life, so he's teaching them that they need this death on the cross. They need his crucifixion to be washed and cleansed. It had to come about, even though the Lord was already granting them forgiveness based upon what Jesus was about to do. Jesus knew that he still had to go through it. He still had to die on the cross. Well, that's what the table reminds us, is that Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to, to give his life for us. He was the only one who could have. His sacrifice was the only one great enough to pay for our sins. We had sinned against an infinite God. We needed an infinitely worthy Savior to give his life. And he had to be one with us. That's why he had to be God and man in order to be our Savior. But that's exactly what he is. And that's what he did. He laid down his life 
And w this is the example that we are to follow. Now, as we prepare to come to the table, there's two questions we need to ask ourselves. And then we'll spend just a couple moments in silent prayer. The first is, have we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we believing in Him alone for our salvation? Is He our only hope of heaven? Not what we do, you know, not how well we obey. Although there needs to be obedience, it's not based on our obedience. It's based on the obedience of Christ. So are we trusting Him alone? First question. Second question, are we doing what Jesus just told us we need to be doing, which is loving one another? Are we following his example of service, his example of love? If we're not, or where we have failed, if we're Christians, we're following it to some degree. But where, we're, where we've failed, and we've all failed, we need to ask the Lord to forgive us. We need to repent of our sins as we come to the table. So let's spend just a few moments in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us prepare then to come to the table.